Okay, let's talk about CO2 once again, but for a slightly different reason. In this video, I actually wanted to talk about a relatively recent study that for the first time ever kind of figured out why carbon dioxide does what it does. In other words, why this unusual molecule seems to be such an incredibly good greenhouse gas, which actually by itself is somewhat surprising. And surprisingly, the answer seems to be quantum in nature. It's basically quantum physics. And more importantly, it's once again completely accidental. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's talk about CO2 and what makes it such a potent greenhouse gas, and also talk about what this research means for astrobiology and for our search for some kind of a planet out there that might have habitable conditions. But first, history. History that I think most people are entirely not familiar with. And here everything starts in the 19th century. In 1856, this wonderful person, an American scientist by the name of Eunice Foote, performed a really interesting experiment. She basically took two glass cylinders and filled one of them with air, yet the other was filled with CO2. And then she just left them in the sun because she wanted to see how effective CO2 is at capturing heat. And to her surprise, she discovered that it was extremely effective. The cylinder filled with CO2 was very hot, whereas the one with the air was barely warm, which made her realize CO2 was an excellent absorber of heat. She then ended up publishing it, basically becoming one of the first climate scientists, in this case completely by accident. And then just a few years later, an Irish researcher, John Tyndall, was able to replicate her experiment and was one of the first to officially recognize how this could have actual effects on the Earth's climate. In his paper that you can find in the description, he basically talks about his studies on glaciers, and this is by the way from 1861, and how in his opinion, water vapor and carbon dioxide must produce a change of climate. Those are basically his exact words. But it wasn't until 1896 that a Swedish scientist, Svante Arrhenius, one of the Nobel Prize winners for his work in chemistry, was actually the first to officially calculate potential increases in temperature if the levels of CO2 continuously increase. And though his calculations may have been a little bit on the lower side, back then literally no one actually doubted him. And more importantly, by 1937, a fellow Montrealer, Guy Calendar, was the first to physically document rising temperatures correlated with CO2 levels. So the first confirmation for the CO2 effects were back in 1937. You can read more about his research and a lot of other researchers from the early 20th century in some of the links in the description. And so the actual effects of CO2 were pretty well known over a hundred years ago. But the question of why was actually not answered until relatively recently. In other words, even though we knew the effects were definitely there, it wasn't actually until our understanding of quantum physics that the answers finally became available. And that's because, by itself, a CO2 molecule should not be anything special. First of all, it's a linear molecule, such as, for example, this right here, beryllium fluoride. And unlike methane or a lot of other greenhouse gases, it essentially has two-dimensional structure. In other words, when this molecule gets disturbed and when the atoms start to vibrate, by itself CO2 does not have a lot of motion and should technically lose a lot of its motion or a lot of its extra energy really quickly. Whereas methane molecule, because it's three-dimensional, tends to vibrate in all sorts of directions and is thus able to retain heat quite effectively. Yet somehow CO2 is able to do this as well, making it a bit of an oddball when it comes to linear molecules and when it comes to chemistry. And while well, this new study essentially tried to finally answer what's going on here using an idea known as Fermi resonance that usually applies to something entirely different. It's a concept from quantum spectroscopy, or essentially interactions of photons. And it's essentially an extra amplitude very often produced as a result of quantum interactions. But here this was the first time ever it was applied to atoms and molecules and the way that they vibrate producing a three-atom interaction. And turns out that CO2, completely by accident, also produces this resonance, which then gives it extra vibration and extra heat. But I guess in order to try to understand this, here the researchers do provide us with a kind of a visual analogy. And so here is how it roughly works. I think we're all familiar with pendulum, and the overall motion of the pendulum as it swings side to side. But there is a slightly more complex version of this, known as the double pendulum. And this tends to produce an extremely chaotic motion that sometimes ends up being boosted as both of the weights adopt their overall momentum, dramatically jumping higher and higher as they go. 
which tends to produce very chaotic motion with a lot of extra peaks and a lot of extra energy. Here's actually a really cool photo with a long exposure of a double pendulum with an LED attached. And that's the analogy for what's happening with the CO2 as well. Here we have two oxygens, which kind of act like those two weights, that end up shifting energies all over the place, but mostly using this V2 configuration. Although in this case, it's all a result of mixing of their quantum wave functions, or basically the atoms, if you represent them as a quantum wave, here the interaction between these waves ends up producing the double pendulum-like motion. And so this is essentially Fermi resonance, and it leads to two separate effects. First effect is a sudden jump to higher energy, a jump that usually happens around certain frequencies, which can also lead to a sudden jump to a low energy state that's much lower than usual as well, which then leads to the extra effect of a much wider absorption spectrum, which allows the CO2 molecule to absorb a lot of energy from a lot of different infrared spectra. And intriguingly, the Fermi resonance in this case seems to contribute at least half of the total warming effect that's also known as the radiative forcing, the effects of which are summarized in this graph right here. On the left you see what would happen without Fermi resonance, whereas on the right we see the effects after Fermi resonance. And so at temperatures between minus 20 Celsius to maybe about 17 Celsius, or basically what we usually find on our planet, most CO2 molecules, because they tend to vibrate with the V2 vibrational ground state, end up having Fermi resonance, because in this case, completely by accident, the stretching frequency is basically double of the bending frequency, which literally makes it act like that double pendulum. And that's really the unusual part. The fact that one frequency is the double of the other frequency is completely accidental. In a lot of other linear molecules, or really any other molecules, this is unlikely to be the case. And so just like with that double pendulum example, instead of having one large peak, we get two relatively large peaks that are slightly shifted from the original value, which in practice results in a lot of heat being retained by the molecule, and thus the overall energy of the molecule increased over time. Or, in other words, it makes it a greenhouse gas. But it's this accidental resonance that's particularly interesting. And interesting because this study also provides us with formula that's applicable to other gases as well and other molecules. So it becomes possible to calculate if this might happen to something else, especially when it comes to astrobiology or search for habitable planets. Because here, by trying to find other molecules that might have this unusual quantum vibration, we might be able to find other greenhouse gases in atmospheres of different planets, which could then lead to better climatic models and better understanding of planetary habitability. So basically here the idea is to find this unusual quantum resonance in other gases that we might find on other planets. And so maybe it's not just CO2 that we should be looking for, but other gases in other conditions that could also become greenhouse gases if they end up producing Fermi resonance. So, a pretty intriguing discovery and, I guess, a final scientific explanation for why CO2 is such a potent greenhouse gas, but also, of course, a really important study for researchers studying atmospheres of different exoplanets. Because even right now, we still have trouble figuring out how hot or how cold certain planets are. One example is actually that planet we mentioned previously known as K218b. Some of the first discoveries suggested that it's maybe some kind of a water world or a high sea world and might even have signs of life, including methane and potentially dimethyl sulfate. You can learn more about this in one of the videos in the description. But more recent studies discovered that it might be actually super hot. And that's because even right now we don't really understand how some gases might interact in atmospheres of exoplanets. But hopefully in the next 10 or so years, we'll have some definitive answers about all of this and we'll hopefully have learned so much from a lot of different studies, such as the one that was just released. And so once we find out something else, I'll make sure to follow this up with the next part. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.